Xenomatics is a leader in true, solid-state LiDAR technology. The Xenotrack 6D road scanning system helps engineers, surveyors, and inspectors by delivering a complete 6D digital twin of the road. Xenotrack replaces time-consuming visual inspections and reduces cost by allowing road authorities to quickly and more accurately analyze the surface for roughness, cracks, potholes, and other damages. With its fast and simple installation, Xenotrack can be mounted on any fleet vehicle anywhere, anytime. In under an hour and with the push of a button, city officials can begin gathering the data needed to determine which areas should be prioritized for repair. Here's how it works. Available in single and dual lane applications, Xenotrack establishes the three-dimensional geometry of the road surface, calculating the International Roughness Index and Rutting Quality Index. Xenotrack can accommodate all road surfaces, including concrete, asphalt, and cobblestone. Only one driver is required to collect and view the data, which can be obtained at both higher and lower speeds. Xenotrack leverages a millimeter accurate 3D geometric twin and high resolution 2D camera images. In a single pass, the entire road is digitized and any index or quality parameter can be calculated according to local or international standards. Xenotrack also detects and logs important road and lane markings like arrows or painted messages on the ground with accurate geofencing thanks to real-time kinematic positioning. After completing the drive, road maintenance personnel can take the data back to their workstation for further review and evaluation. The data transfer process from Xenotrack is simplified to maximize productivity for surveyors. After processing and all quality features are calculated, the data is ready to import into a personal pavement management or geographical information system. Our engineering team meets with customers to examine the data and provide additional support. With Xenotrack, customers can prioritize and budget for critical road repairs, saving time and long-term costs. At Xenomatics, our mission is to provide road safety and comfort with reliable, versatile, and affordable true solid-state LiDAR. Good day, everyone. A warm welcome to this enlightening webinar brought to you by the IRF Global's Committee on Asset Management. Regardless of your location and current time, we extend our sincere gratitude for your active engagement. I'm Majid Labiat, privileged, privileged to serve as the Senior Vice President at the IRF Global, and I'm honored to guide today's proceedings. As many of you are, are already aware, the IRF Global was established in 1948 with a pivotal goal to foster the exchange of best practices and the seamless transfer of technological advancements. Even after 75 years, this commitment remains as important as ever. Our IRF Global Webinars are an integral facet of our mission to facilitate the dissemination of knowledge, experiences, and technologies, all in service of creating enhanced, safer, inclusive, and resilient road and transportation systems. Furthermore, I extend a personal invitation to each webinar participant to join us at the IRF Global R2T Conference and Exhibition, scheduled for November 14 to 17, 2023 in Phoenix, Arizona, where we, where we will com commemorate 75 years of IRF Global's impactful journey. Before immersing ourselves in, this captive, in the captivating content of today's webinar, I'd like to kindly remind our first-time attendees that your microphones are muted for the duration of the session. However, we wholeheartedly encourage your active participation. Your questions and insights are highly valued. Kindly share them by typing into the question section of the control panel, situated conveni conveniently on the right side of your screen. During the Q&A session, I'll curate the questions and answer them as long as time allows. Please, I also ask you to refrain from altering presenter views on your control panel as we're fortunate to have multiple esteemed presenters sharing their insights. Rest assured that all IRF webinars are recorded and each registrant 
will be provided with a PDF version of the presentation, along with a comprehensive video recording of the entire session. In addition, all IRF members have complimentary access to the extensive library of IRF webinars, where areas non-members have the option to access our collection through a single or multi-user license account. For those of you who are yet to experience the benefits of IRF membership, I encourage you to reach out to me following this webinar. With these logistical details now addressed, we stand poised to embark on our journey of knowledge. The theme of today's webinar, aptly titled, How to Plan and Budget Your Pavement Management Based on a 6D Digital Scan, is part of an ongoing webinar series with the IRF Asset Management Committee. Our pleasure knows no bounds as we introduce our presenters for today. Chris Demeester, Vice President, Sales and Business Development, and Jacopo Alemo, Head of North America. Chris, the floor is yours. Thank you, Magins. If you make me presenter. Okay, let me share my screen. Are you all capable of seeing my screen, Majid? Yes, I can see it. Okay, yes. then we're ready good to go. Okay, and Jacopo can uh, control as well. Thank you, Majid. Thank you for the, for the welcome. Thank you to have the opportunity to present our uh, experience uh, to the IRF uh, members. So welcome everybody to this webinar in how to plan and budget your pavement management and specifically using a six dimensional digital twin. Digitization and digital twins are still buzzwords, but not anymore just future thinking. Many authorities worldwide have engaged in digitizing the public assets, including also the road infrastructure and related assets. But fragmented digital twins between different departments and administrations are not the solution is what we experience. We strongly advocate to gather all digital twins in a centralized platform. To update the digital twins regularly in that centralized platform and to give online access to the authorized stakeholders to share and what to share objective and trustworthy digitization is obtained with automated analysis of digital twins objective analysis and budget savings are realized through well-planned maintenance and repairs based on these qualified objective indicators that is, in a nutshell, the content of today's webinar. The easy interpretation of the digital twin is a major factor to obtain the budget savings, which is a topic of today. From your desk, you need an overview of the condition of your assets, and in this case, the pavement assets. A human brain is programmed to interpret green as good, yellow and orange as doubtful, and red or black as bad. So we use those colors. So to manage your pavement assets, the same colors can be applied to make interpretation very intuitive and easy. We will show that the digitized roads make it easy to extract objective and highly relevant numbers, indices that translate easily in those colors, green, yellow, and red or black. In our R&D department, we work closely together with the Belgian Road Research Center. And they are a scientific research and that has proven, and their research has proven that it's economically beneficial to measure and repair pavement regularly compared to letting the road degrade and having to do more expensive repairs, but later on. No, it's better to do it regularly early. So there is an optimum to minimize the sum cost of survey and repair, and it favors regular condition survey. We even have a customer in Japan that measures their road network 
of thousands of miles twice a year. One time before winter and one time just after the winter. And after that winter survey, that customer immediately defines the required works to execute over the summer period with the sole purpose that the impact of the next winter remains limited and that he minimizes his repair budget over time. So the, at the end of this webinar, you will have gained insights that when you digitize your pavement assets and you do the same for other related assets, you get an objective trustworthy and manageable overview of your pavement assets. And in the same time, a tool to pinpoint actions to take that impact your budget. Extra advantage is that you can easily share information with colleagues and even with contractors. Digitization is not a goal on its own, but it's a means to have a good understanding of your asset condition and to spend your budget just in time and save budget despite more regular pavement digitization surveys. You might also save money with clear proof of the contractor's performance on the contract requirements. So just after they do their job, check whether they did it correctly. So the goal is to save budget. And this defines the agenda of today. We start with an example, then connect the six-dimensional digital twin to productive pavement management. We'll describe the device to collect the six-dimensional digital twin, extend to use to some special use cases, not only roads. Before we end with a short introduction of Xenomatics, and we'll check the learnings. Jacopo, I'll give you the floor for the example. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for the for the intro. So, yeah, let's start uh, with. Uh, okay, let's start with uh, an example uh, with the city of uh, Loven in specific. Okay. So uh, here you see the payment management system from uh, Leuven, a larger city near Brussels, and uh, also the innovation capital of Europe in uh, 2020. The city started uh, some months ago with this uh, new payment management uh, system, and here you see a section of uh, their road uh, network. Data has been collected over all these roads, resulting in automatically and objectively calculated road condition uh, measures. High road quality is then represented in the green color, medium quality in yellow, and the worst roads uh, have received a red or even black score. At this stage and in this example, the road condition index is the IRI, the International Roughness Index. That's a standardized and worldwide used road quality index, as most of you know. Let's zoom in on uh, this street with uh, red and black uh, color scholars to understand better the level uh, and the root causes for this uh, evaluation. We zoom in and uh, for uh, all the uh, uh, roads, we get more detailed scores per road uh, section. We zoom in further and keep our focus on the identified street to investigate. We can zoom up to the level of uh, a single uh, a single street, like we see here. Then, as a next uh, further um, uh, level of information, if you have an ortho photo available in your uh, GIS uh, system, you can check on the housing condition around the street. When uh, planning works, you can prepare the mobility plan and evaluate the disturbance uh, for the local resident during the work. Also, the contractor can see where uh, he can unload and park his, uh, his equipment. 
We zoom in further and visualize the layer of the digital twin, the LAS file, the measured um, digital data. You immediately see why this strip got the red and black uh, condition for it. The digital twin is the three-dimensional geometry of the world. Since uh, it, has, uh, it is hard to present a three dimension on a flat computer screen, we give different colors for different heights. Green means uh, um, uh, flat road, blue and purple meaning substances, uh, lower level, and yellow and red for geometry sticking out like a bump. Zooming in, um, zooming in detail, you notice that uh, this street has many spots of substances and photos and also part of the road sticking out. Intuitively, you already have an impression of why the scores of these two streets are red and black. Um, when we focus on the digital twin, uh, we see manholes sunk in a, a larger portal, subsidences to the side of, uh, um, of the street. I went too far. Yes, okay. This was the uh, slide I was, uh, I was mentioning. <clears throat> and uh, uh, another level of uh, information is coming from another example, like in, in this slide. There is a little bit of delay, so I'm sometimes. Okay. Um, like in this, in this different road, we can see uh, another example of different type of uh, distress. Uh, in this case, uh, rusting clearly on the 3D digital twin image. And for people with experience, you can imagine the cause or even uh, the repair and required cost. Uh, we are talking here about uh, uh, tile and the top layer of the foundation must have been uh, or have become unstable and the sand below the tile migrated on the middle uh, portion of the road, pushed by the weight of heavy traffic. The digital twin enables measuring in detail uh, as if you are on, uh, on site, on, uh, on the spot. And uh, digitalization is feasible for any surface. Asphalt, concrete, cobblestone, tiles, and even, as you see in this example, for gravel uh, roads and off-road surfaces. Some municipalities in the countryside, especially in the US and Canada, have responsibilities for unpaved roads as well. They need to keep them accessible for local residents. And uh, last of these uh, uh, examples, user cases, um, let's talk about uh, bicycle lanes. When we talk about uh, payment management, more and more attention is spent to bicycle mobility and hence bike paths, especially in the dense countries in the United States, but also in the large American uh, cities like uh, Washington DC. Federal and uh, European governments spend billions of dollars to construct, improve, and maintain uh, bike paths. And with this, uh, let's move to the next uh, chapter of our presentation. Chris, you can take over. Thank you, Jacopo. Oh. So in the next section, we connect productive payment management to that six dimensional digital twin. The 6D, the six dimension stands for six dimensions, meaning three dimensions for the geometry of the road surface, one extra dimension to include pavement markings, really important, I'll come back later, and additionally, the two dimensions of the high definition photos that we take every five meters, not to have too much overlap. So that's the six dimensions. That data is captured independent of the road type, eh? with the accuracy to allow, important to allow correct calculation of standardized indices like we have the IRI, rotting, or other evenness coefficients. 
This video shows the data collection followed by the resulting three-dimensional digital road. The colors are chosen to visualize the geometry. So green again for flat surface, blue and purple for surface parts below the flat average, and yellow and red for surface parts above the flat average. Let me take the laser pointed. So here you see that those colors indeed correspond to real geometry. It's just a representation, visualization to ease for easy interpretation. But you see the 3D geometry of the worn and hollowed longitudinal joints between left and right lane, and the blue potholes and the blue cracks. This digitized road, road is a starting point to extract pavement quality indices from. From a digitized road, you can extract any longitudinal or any lateral section. You see here at the bottom two longitudinal sections, a light blue and a yellow section. And on the top, you see three lateral sections, a yellow, red, and green one. On the longitudinal sections, you can apply the standardized formula, mathematical formula, to calculate the IRI. On the lateral sections, you can calculate the rutting values, also according to a standardized formula. Just a quick reminder on the definition of the IRI. It's the quality standard developed by the World Bank in 1986, if I'm correct, and still very actual worldwide. There are just some countries in Europe, like Belgium, France, and Germany, they develop a slightly different evenness formula, but anywhere else, the IRI is applicable and the standard. It's a very solid measure. The IRI is the most relevant measure to reflect safety and comfort, as for the purpose when they defined it based on the quarter car, as you can see. It's my belief that IRI and rutting together remain the two most important measures for road quality. While the IRI is mainly calculated for the wheel tracks and sometimes the middle of the lane, the rutting is calculated every one or 10 centimeters. So potholes and cracks anywhere on that surface of the lane cannot escape the measure and will influence the rutting measure. But when you digitize the pavement in the six-dimensional digital twin, you get much more information than just information to calculate IRI and gutting. For instance, road markings. Once digitized, you can monitor the road markings quality, their visibility, which is the function of road markings. They have a function of safety. And besides the quality monitoring, you have the information where which road markings are placed. And you can share that information with a contractor for, for instance, to repaint jobs, to repaint the markings. You can even calculate the amount of paint you need, all from your desk. But when you have that six-dimensional digitized pavement, you want to do more with it, even more with it. You want to plan, plan and budget the repairs, the topic of today. And depending on the shape of the pavement distress, you need a different repair. And probably different personnel, a different team, or a different contractor. So you'd like to have a list of distresses per type of repair. For this reason, and not so much to quantify the pavement quality in the overview, but for these reasons to split the repairs, a 6D digitized pavement allows to detect and classify extra categories of road distress that you can group per repair method. So this allows the road owner to assign specific repair jobs to his team or to an external company. For this purpose, the 6D sensor system that we present detects and categorizes 14 extra detailed road distresses on top of the IRI and the rutting. Going from different types of cracks, as you can see, over shoulder damage, potholes to bleeding and wavering, all detected and classified automatically by computer algorithms. 
The output of the computer algorithms consists of annotated pictures with color box, so you see why the computer indicated so much surface with cracks. It also includes the color visualization with the pavement distress type, the boxes around. And besides the annotated pictures, the output includes a file, a file listing all the distresses with their category, what kind of distress it is, and their centimeter precise geolocalization. And it is this highly accurate localization that allows the system to connect the 2D photo pictures to the 3D geometrical data. A distress can be recognized on the 2D picture, but the geometry of subsidence, how much does it, did it uh, go down or bump, uh, how much did it go up? And the seriousness of the defect of the distress can only be identified on 3D geometry. And the color map with again green for flat, blue for subsidence, and yellow or red for geometry sticking out on top will give you that information. On this picture, you see the patch. And you can see that the patch shows subsidence, the blue and purple color. All these road characteristics, all 14, are extracted from the six dimensional digitized pavement. No matter the pavement type, huh? asphalt, concrete, element paving, or even unpaved roads. And just like the measure of IRI or rutting that you can visualize in your GS, in your geographical information system, to get the quality overview with IRI and rutting. These 14 extra road distress categories also translate in another quality index or indices, quality measures. Here you see which, uh, that we present the visual index or a structural index or a combined global index. It's not our invention, it's really coming from scientific research uh, and information shared from the Belgian Road Research Center to us. And as you see, these indices accumulate different pavement distress categories with each their respective weight to come up with one value to see what is the status of the pavement. So it also includes the percentage of surface that each distress affects. However, we need to understand that too much detailed information can jeopardize the usage of the information. So an all-in quality measure to start the analysis from is definitely an approach to go. Where to look for and study and go in more detail. So that brings me back to the IRI and rutting. Combining the IRI with rutting and then the global index brings us to an overall PCI, the Pavement Condition Index, for which apparently different formulas circulate. So the purpose is different. I am writing to have the overview of the quality and then zoom in. And if you want to plan for your repair, you work with the different distresses that require the same kind of repair. So the overview showing an overall quality index to start from is what we propose. And then adding the flexibility to show this view by either IRI routing or by either particular distress, distress category or group that needs a certain similar operational action or budgeting. And that brings us to the next topic, uh, Jacopo. The floor is yours. Thank you, Chris. So I hope we convince you of the value of the 6D digital, digitalization model. Now let's see how to collect uh, this data and uh, preferably all this data in one single ride.
looking at the traditional payment uh, inspection uh, devices, uh, we recognize devices that return only one quality measure, as uh, in the case of the APL, the analyzer of the profile in the longitudinal direction. The APL returns only an uh, IRI or similar even as measure uh, or similar to a laser profilometer resulting in also one single uh, measure, only one measure. Or um, a multifunctional vehicle with uh, a multitude of sensors mounted on it, making the device complete in its uh, data output, but very expensive and difficult to operate and maintain. And the main goal remains to save on your budget, not to shift from repair, repair budget to survey budget. So a simple and affordable device that you can mount on your existing vehicle and that return the full six bit digital payment is what we search for. Here we show a picture of uh, such a payment inspection system. The white cylinder shaped device is a special non-rotating LiDAR. On top stand a HD camera and the geolocalization is realized for both LiDAR and camera by an integrated RTK GNFS IMU using a double antenna reception. The system comes in a single version measured, uh, measuring uh, 4 meter or 13 feet wide lane per ride. And also in a dual lane version measuring uh, up to 7.5 meters or 24 feet wide, including the lane where the measure, measuring vehicle is driving and a neighboring uh, lane, either on the left or on the right. Obviously, a dual lane version gives higher productivity since the one, rail, one ride uh, measures two lanes in one shot. But uh, pay attention to avoid interference with overtaking traffic on the neighboring lane while measuring. Especially for uh, road authorities and uh, road surveyors that specialize in highways and multi-lane roads, the productivity increase with such a double lane system is significant. And it gives opportunities to get more detailed insights on the full highway. Today, often, only the slow lane of a highway is measured for reason of time and requires speed uh, on the left lane. Also, it's the lane with uh, heavier traffic. With a dual lane system, you can drive on the middle lane and collect the data for the middle and the left lane. Or uh, when you drive on the slow lane on the right, you, uh, like, you do, like you do today, you also capture the road conditions in the middle lane. So more data to decide whether the full highway needs a reconditioning or only a specific lane. By the way, that specific uh, customer Chris uh, was uh, uh, talking about earlier, who measured a thousand of miles in uh, his road network since, uh, uh, okay, twice a year, is a customer using a dual lane system. So you can imagine. So the LiDAR device uh, in the 6D system is uh, not uh, at all a standard LiDAR. It is a special road LiDAR. How does it work? As long as the vehicle doesn't move, uh, 28,000 lasers measure the same 28,000 points on the road surface. It's when the vehicle starts uh, driving that uh, all these lasers scan the road surface and that the same point uh, on the road surface is measured multiple times, resulting in a millimeter accuracy of the road geometry. And the millimeter accuracy is required for accurate IRI and rapid measures. Here you see the same with a top view and side view combined. Let's drive the car. Okay, oops, too fast. 
The output of a single lane and a dual lane system is completely similar with the 3D geometry of the road. Let's start the video. Chris, can you start the video here, please? Thank you. So, uh, so it's, yeah. It's not a video, I think, is it? Uh, it, it, it should start automatically. Okay. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> um, so the dual lane has a resolution down to 10 millimeters in uh, both directions, uh, whereas the single lane has a resolution down to 5 millimeters uh, in both longitudinal and uh, lateral, lateral direction. Okay, so let's see another uh, quite critical example. Here, um, the four dimensions are very useful, um, especially with cobblestone uh, roads. Okay, uh, remarks in this uh, zoom that the detail visible for each, uh, um, each uh, cobblestone, each uh, stone, and the depth of the joints in between. And here we have another uh, view of the same scene uh, using the reflectivity. So um, adding uh, that uh, four dimensions, the high definition to the camera images, uh, exactly match the precise geolocalization, build up the six dimensional uh, digitalized payment. So, uh, like any innovative uh, new technology and concept, the device, the device uh, to measure affordably the 60 digital, digitalized payment needs uh, validation and proof of performance and uh, verified outcome of the result. The NCAT test is widely accepted as the ultimate uh, test and uh, this device indeed passed the NCAT test as shown in, uh, in this slide. Beside the NCAT test, the customer of this uh, new concept have compared the result with their traditional devices, their expensive multifunctional vehicles, and came out absolutely positively. Indeed, productivity is key. Let me summarize in five points the gain of productivity uh, with this uh, 6D Xenotrack system. So this new concept system uh, can be set up uh, quickly and easily on any vehicle and can be swapped from one vehicle to another. Let me also add that uh, uh, the system can be easily uh, transported uh, as uh, uh, check baggage with you. So the road lidar Seno truck digitalize any road at speeds up to 90 kilometers per hour or 60 miles per hour with the same performance and both during day condition and night condition. The post processing is started on board while collecting the data for um, and to get your result at the end of the, the, the survey day. And the, the data are, uh, of course, uh, highly accurate and uh, with a high resolution, more than most of you will probably ever need. Last but not least, the dual lane system can further increase your data collection productivity with a factor of two. And with this, Chris, okay, I hand over to you the presentation. Thank you, Jacopo. So let's now think out of the box in special use cases 
and think of some challenging cases in which a six-dimensional digital digitized pavement can help planning, save budgets, or present business opportunities. Besides the planning in your pavement management system, there is a relationship between the pavement condition and utilities underneath the pavement. One time, we reported our road survey data to a community and pointed out a suspicious larger area of substance near to some manholes. The mayor requested inspection of the sewage and part of the piping turned out to be broken. So important underground damage, like important leakage, cause subsidence in the pavements. That's the relationship. And therefore, we promote a regular road survey, not only to check the pavement, but also to check, or possibly to check assets lying underneath the pavement. Another case, I don't know whether you remember, but I, I still remember very well, about 10 years ago, we had a kind of a big accident in Brussels the capital of Europe, huh? a public transportation bus fell down in a big hole in the middle of the road because a leak in the water piping had eroded and the road foundation was attached. But the pavement kept until it couldn't take the weight of a fully loaded transportation bus, fully loaded with people. The bus fell in the collapsed pavement and people were injured and the road was closed for over six months. It really was a political crisis at the time for the Brussels government, and all Europe was witnessing. So the lesson learned is that regular road surveys can prevent accidents and give you more information than just the condition of the road. There's not a one cause relationship necessarily, but it gives you much more inf information that you might think. And also important lesson is that productivity is enhanced if you gather related assets like sewage in one and the same platform where you keep the condition of your pavement. So gather all those assets and indices and quality measures in one platform. Let me tell you another story. An intercity road showed worn concrete slabs, resulting in lots of traffic noise and discomfort for the commuters and for the neighbors. And as always, a year before election, I don't know if it's the same in your country, but in Belgium it's like this, a, way, a year before election, the council decided to renew the worn concrete slabs to please the voters. The works were executed and the works were delivered, inspected and accepted. Less than a month later, and by the way, still before elections, complaints from people were accumulating, horrified as they were that the condition of the road was worse than before. We digitized the road, and indeed, we identified that the IRI on the location of the concrete slabs was poor. Looking at the photo, however, you see no harm. But when you take a side, the digitized pavement model, the geometrical model, we can clearly, clearly see the lateral grooves. Remember the geometry colors. And green is flat, blue and purple is subsidence or lower level, and yellow and red is sticking out on top, higher surface. So the lateral grooves show a kind of a washboard in the driving direction. During the road construction, the flattening of the concrete must have been done with a ruler a manual ruler, manually, and that's allowed by the contract. But the concrete was too dry, must have been too dry, and hence was sticking to that ruler, and the ruler was pulling away concrete material and creating this way grooves. So not only does the 3D show you the damage, it often indicates the cause and sometimes the repair. That's the insight you get from 3D or from 6D digitizing of your payment. I remind one more time on the value of the digitized road markings to allow for monitoring the quality of the painting for safety reason, as well for communicating with the contractor to where painting need to be applied after renewal of the pavements, or even for calculating the amount of paint 
you need to do. Another example, special use case. Are you familiar with bank angles on highways? Bank angles are applied to keep the cars safe on the road in turns and at higher speeds, so on highways. Bank angles aren't high, no big numbers in degrees, just a few degrees, but they play an important role in safety though. And therefore, they need to be monitored. <clears throat> and yes, a digitized pavement with highly precise geolocalization of every part of the pavement gives you the information to check and monitor that bank angle. And when we talk about pavements, most people think about road pavements, but bicycle paths, as mentioned already before, also have pavement and also need monitoring for safety and comfort. So the same concept of six dimensional digital modeling on bike lanes is applicable, returning probably other quality indices than the IEI, but still quality and safety indices. And not only public roads need monitoring and control, proving grounds and test tracks even more. I don't know if the, in the attendees in the public there are people that are working on proving grounds. If you think about Indianapolis 500 or Formula One racetracks, they require higher standards than any public road to provide safety at extreme high speeds. And proving grounds in automotive, they are meant to stay unchanged. The proving ground itself should be stable, unchanged, so the vehicle behavior improvement that they measure can be allocated to the vehicle changes instead of the pavement changes. What about airports, taxiways and runways? Clearly airport runways are as much or more monitoring and control than even racetracks to keep the 300 passengers on board safe during takeoff and landing. The last project we did, we had to drive 15 times back and forth with a single lane device to have the full width of the runway captured. It only took us two hours, but with a double lane, we would have managed the job in one hour. And it's actually all these cases that motivate contractors to use the same digitization concept for measuring the newly paved road during the pavement process itself. Some road paving equipment manufacturers are even developing solutions to monitor and control the work ongoing in the machine. Jacopo, I let you present the company. Thank you, thank you, Chris. Uh, yeah, with all uh, all of you digesting uh, all this information, I take a short moment to present and uh, introduce uh, uh, Xenomatics. So, Xenomatics is a LiDAR company founded in 2013, developing new LiDAR technology for many markets, from automotive to industrial and, of course, road markets, providing hardware, software, uh, customized development, services, and data. Uh, we are headquartered in, uh, in Belgium, as you may have understood uh, with all the cobblestone uh, uh, examples. So yeah, we are very close to Brussels. And uh, we have also an office uh, in Detroit, uh, in Michigan, uh, in Berlin, in Germany, and in uh, Suzu, in China. We collaborate with uh, technical and commercial partners in different parts uh, of the world. In any case, uh, um, if you are not 100% convinced of the value presented, maybe the example of highly recognizable customer in different markets from surveyors to automotive or mapping and mining, maybe this can persuade you. So let's uh, summarize uh, uh, again the learning at the end of, uh, of the presentation. So, Uh, yeah, by now um, you should have gained insight that uh, when uh, you digitalize uh, your payment assets uh, and uh, you do the same for other related uh, assets, like uh, sewage, an example, you get an objective, trustworthy, and manageable overview of your payment assets in your GIS system. And 
in the same uh, time a tool to pinpoint action that will save your job, uh, your budget. Extra, um, extra advantage is that you can easily share information digitally with your colleagues and even contractors through your GIS system and other cloud platforms. So digitalization is not a goal on its own, but a means to have a good understanding of your payment condition and to spend your budget uh, wisely, just in time, and uh, also minimize your regular payment um, uh, maintenance needs thanks to digitalized survey. So you might also save money with a clear proof of the contractor's performance on the contract requirements. And uh, again, the goal is to save budget. On the other hand, if uh, you are a surveyor, um, the added value that you get from a 6D um, LiDAR is that it shows uh, absolutely high accuracy for reliable um, uh, quality measures. It combines such information as required, including uh, road marking information, and it can be used easily on your existing vehicle, so you don't need to invest in new equipment um, and expensive cars or trucks. It can further improve your productivity at a lower cost and give you access to the raw digital uh, model. Indeed, feel free to uh, reach out to us. We will be also present at the Intergeo uh, in uh, uh, the next uh, month. Uh, in Berlin, or uh, via email. Uh, here you can see the contact information of myself and my colleagues. So, Majid, I think that now is uh, time for question and answer. We have 10 minutes, so I let you uh, take over the presentation. Thank you, Jacopo, and a heartfelt appreciation uh, to you and Chris for your captivating uh, presentation. Uh, so for everybody, as you said, we transition to the interactive Q&A phase of our webinar. So um, as you continue formulating your questions, kindly recall that this webinar is held under the auspices of the IRF Global's Committee on Road Asset Management. Should you desire further information about our advocacy endeavors and training initiatives, please don't hesitate to contact me via email following up this session. I already do have a few questions, so I'm going to uh, read them off uh, to, to you and Chris, and you guys let me know which one uh, if you would like to answer. So the first question is, what is the minimum length of pavement section that has a single IRI data point? How is the IRI data affected by factors such as vehicle speed, vehicle type, sudden stop, and start of vehicle? So I can take that. The IRI uh, that is uh, measured over sections of 100 meter or 20 meter, so that's it's a parameter. Um, the uh, standard allows to define whether it's every 20 meter or 100 meter. The effect of the speed uh, is proven in tests that actually Jacopo's team has been doing for the NCAT. So testing and calculating IRI at 30 miles per hour, 50 miles an hour, uh, 20 miles an hour gives the same result. So has no influence. And also the vehicle, as long as you position it and you mount it at the right height, it gives the same result. Yeah, okay, let, let me add a quick that uh, um, traditional uh, inertial profiler um, are heavily affected by the performance of uh, their IMU, uh, while 6D LIDARs uh, being uh, uh, area, area scanner, not line scanner, are completely independent by IMU accuracy. Indeed, that, that, that means that even starting and stopping is no issue, huh? which for many others it is. So it gives the flexibility to really drive as you normally drive and have uh, correct measurements. Okay, thank you, Jacopo. And um, 
And Chris, so we got the next question here is for unpaved roads, what is the minimum threshold for measuring surface deflection using LIDAR? Minimum threshold? Uh, um, is it threshold for the what? IRI or is it threshold for what? I mean, the, the system can measure even very fluctuating with so meaning a very high, very uncomfortable road, very high IRI, it still can measure. So the depth that the, 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 me the measurement system can measure is, uh, is, is up to 40 uh, cent or 80 centimeters. So you can have potholes of 40 centimeter up and bumps of 40 centimeter, and you still measure it very accurately. The threshold Moreover, that you require yeah, for an off-road road to be comfortable, yeah, that's depending on the authority. Moreover, uh, thanks to this uh, uh, high, like wide height threshold, uh, the sensor can also use it to capture uh, gutter and uh, sidewalk while driving on the main road. Uh, so if a sidewalk has a height is, uh, of uh, one or two feet from the road level, it can still be captured by the sensor. Uh, and being a, a um, solid state system without moving parts is not subject uh, to vibration that are typically present on off-road uh, um, condition. Uh, so mm, the measurement can be highly reliable also with heavy vibration. And some of the customers, they use it to measure for off-roads the width of the road, so to see if the tractors can still uh, pass through. And that's then the responsibility of the, uh, of the, of the road network owner for that off-road part. They also use it in mining for, for, for measuring other things. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chris and Akopo. We have a few more questions. Again, as a reminder, if you have more questions, uh, make sure uh, to input them in the, um, in, the in the control panel where it says questions. And that in that panel, you can enter your questions. So I have another question here and it says, has this system been certified for ASTM and ASHTO compliance for, IR for IRI and rutting measurements in the USA? Yakobo. Yes. Uh, yeah, actually, the, the goal of the NCAT uh, test was exactly to uh, check the compliance of the system with uh, ASHTO and ASTM. So, um, as you may have seen in the slide, but you, you, can, you can see directly the result of that measurement. We passed the uh, accuracy and repeatability um, test for uh, ASHTO. So yeah, can the system can be used for, yeah. Okay, thank you. can you. share thank more you. information if, if they want that. Eh? You have our email address. Uh, we can go, like, we can talk half an hour about the NCAST results, NCAT results. Excellent. And then we have another question here, and it asks, if you have experience with measuring sidewalks at walking speed, We are starting to measure uh, bike lanes and sidewalks. In the, in the projects we've done in some cities, we measure the roads and the sidewalks in the same uh, drive. Um, the, the authorities, however, are trying to define what is a measure to see the quality, the safety then for the sidewalks. But as we presented, you have the full digital version and the purpose of that uh, project was to start discussing and to find out a measure that qualifies the sidewalk, whether it's for handicapped, for wheelchairs, or for elderly people, or forever. So they're, they're using that digitized version from a good sidewalk and a bad sidewalk to then find out what kind of measures they should oblige the contractor to follow. Okay, thank you, Chris. We have, we have another question here, and I think it's a pretty good one. It says, so what are the advantages? What are the advantages of dual lane that make me use it in projects and abandon old devices like laser crack measurement systems, LCMS? 
But the dual lane, the main, the main advantage and the uniqueness of the dual lane is that it's, it's more for highway, as we try to explain. You measure two lanes in one ride. So it's really about productivity. Um, with any other LCMS system or any other, you measure just one lane. So we, we have a full comparison with the LCMS system as well. So we can go, we can also talk 30 minutes or an hour about that. But the, the advantage of the dual lane is really for people where productivity is key. And so as the example of the Japanese uh, surveyor that want to have the full digitized version of the full, uh, yeah, thousands of miles, eh? what was it, uh, 20,000 miles, that they want digitized twice a year uh, and they want not to spend too much time on vehicles and or too much money on vehicles and personnel. They have to have it quickly, the results. So for them, it's really a, a key factor to measure the, the both lanes in one ride. That's the, the, the main uh, purpose there. Yeah, we have also surveyors that operate in uh, municipalities that uh, are main, mostly focused on the lane where the car is driving, but they also like to get more information on the other lane. So also if the data may be partial because there is traffic ongoing, but they can still get very useful insights on the condition of the adjacent line. And the example of the question before of the, the sidewalks or the bike lanes that are neighboring the, the, the pavements, well, with a, with a dual lane, you measure seven and a half meter wide minimum. It can be up to eight meter. And, and if you want to measure end pavement and sidewalks or bike lanes, then uh, this system gives you the opportunity to do so in one right. One, one other example is uh, in case of highway where you want to also digitalize uh, the shoulder of, uh, uh, of the road or the emergency lane. You don't need to drive on the emergency lane or on the shoulder to scan it, but you can drive on the uh, right lane and digitalize completely also the emergency uh, lane or the shoulder of the road. Something that with the traditional uh, single lane system, you cannot do it. Okay, thank you, Copo and Chris. I believe you answered that question uh, sufficiently. And again, uh, you can reach out to Jacopo or Chris after after the webinar for, for more questions. Now, we have another question here, and it asks, so how do you deal with road conditions such as dust, exhaust gases, water-filled potholes, etc.? Yeah. So um, the, the, you, you can go, Chris, then. The whole, the whole system is, is a visual system. Eh? LiDAR is invisible light that you send out, meaning if there are leaves or dust on the surface, it's the top layer that we measure. And eh? light will not go through dust to measure the underneath, underneath layer of asphalt or concrete. So that is the same for any other survey system. Eh? So we measure what's there. If there is a rock on the road, we measure that rock as part of the road. Huh? Um, the rest of dust in the air does not influence, yeah, unless we've not done a test in the desert, with a desert storm, that, that I cannot not, not answer. There they might be an, an influence, but normal, normal dust in, 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 in normal dust on roads, uh, even up to in Arizona, uh, is not influencing uh, in, in, in our experience. What well, was the other, uh, besides dust, what was the other concern, Majid? Uh, it was it was water bottles, uh, yeah, water yeah, filled pots with water. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, we, depending on, on the amount of water, we did some tests uh, before that our laser light is less absorbed by water, but if the potholes are deep, like, like uh, multiple tens of inches, then we do not measure the bottom of the potholes. It also depends on what is the, the, the angle. Huh? So it's a visual system, so the laser lights, laser beams must reach the geometry to measure it. 
that is conditioned. And, and water can absorb part of the energy that you cannot measure up to the bottom. So it's not advised to measure uh, when all potholes are filled with water. Okay, thank you, Chris and Akopo again. So we have quite a few questions here. So we have another question. It says, are distinct road markings being extracted automatically or do they have to be digitized by drawing contours manually? They yeah, are so automatic. For, uh, yeah. for, uh, for lane marking, we have uh, automatic uh, uh, filtering. So we can uh, actually output uh, uh, LIS file containing only points uh, on the on the marking. Um, there is the, the next step will be basically the classification that can be done uh, manually, or you can have you can use your uh, own uh, automated uh, classification tool using this LIS file containing only the lane marking. But so the output gives you a map with where there are the lane markings, just only. You don't have to filter them out yourself. And with that, you can continue and uh, some customers are calculating the, the, the service and hence the amount of, of paint you need. Okay, thank you. Thank you both. Okay, I have another question here and it says, does the system combine both LIDAR and imagery data collection? It does. So it's it's two different devices, the LIDAR and the high definition camera, but they are aligned so that uh, there is a one-to-one -one relation between the pixel of the camera and uh, the point in the point cloud in the digitized, digitized version. And that is done by actually a, a, a procedure and a, and a pretty straightforward alignment. So there is a relation between two with the six six dimensions, and it's all all related. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Chris. And we have another question here. It says, based on the sidewalk or bike lanes question, can pedestrians walking on the sidewalk be filtered away, maybe by scanning twice? Yes. Yeah, so the um, uh, the sensor automatically filter out. Uh, any point that is uh, above uh, uh, one one or two feet uh, from the ground. So in case there is a, a protruding object, it can be a pedestrian or a, a, a pole uh, or um, a trash can, such an example, all these points will be automatically filtered out. Of course, you will have uh, an area with missing points, but normally, uh, also if we talk about uh, pedestrian, the the area occupied by the pedestrian on the sidewalk is minimal, so the loss of data um, normally is compatible with the, with the goal of the survey for uh, sidewalk. If you really need to have a complete uh, complete data, then you can do a second pass, and uh, all the, the output is uh, georeferenced with uh, accuracy in the centimeter level. So. Uh, the two-point cloud will be uh, most likely really uh, superimposed and any hole uh, caused by presence of a pedestrian will be filled by the second scan. If the, if the pedestrian walks are very crowded, then the result will not be good. Huh? But the advantage of a LiDAR system is that you can measure also during night. So if you have really in New York, you want to, well, maybe in New York there's always a full crowd on, on, on the sidewalks. But uh, if you find a, a moment when there's less people on the on the on the sidewalks, that's the moment to to scan to digitize sidewalks. Okay, thank you both for these answers. Um, now we have another question here, and it goes back to the question about the dual lane. Uh, accuracy. So it says, what is the accuracy of the dual lane results that we can extract? Yes. Yeah, so uh, actually, the um, the NCAT test was executed with a dual lane. So 
we have uh, enough accuracy to be compliant with uh, ASTM and ASHTO uh, requirements. Uh, in general, we recommend, uh, we recommend with the dual lane uh, um, an output uh, with a 10 by 10 millimeter resolution and accuracy. Uh, so the same single laser is still uh, below millimeter. Uh, we are talking about 0 0.25 millimeter on the single laser. And the overall uh, point cloud uh, is uh, in the five to six millimeters. So after uh, smoothing geolocalization and uh, uh, stitching. So. Yeah. Okay. No. Thank. Thank you very much, uh, Jacopo. And Jacopo and Chris, how much time do you have uh, to answer um, questions? You want to answer? Take time. We take the time uh, that the audience uh, wants. If you have time. Majid, because we're going over the hour, but I'm okay. No, no, Jacopo, you're okay. We we have, yeah, yeah, have plenty of time. Okay. You can go ahead and keep going with the questions. Okay. So the next question it, it it asks: Does the automated visual distress recognition give the same results in different weather conditions and different sunlight direction intensity? What about the influence of shadows, for example, overhanging trees? Yeah, so the, um, uh, the principle uh, uh, that we are using um, requires some training, and the training is uh, executed with uh, um, uh, uh, photos and uh, point cloud taken in different weather conditions and different uh, road conditions. So um, the, the neural network is, has been trained to behave in the same uh, level with different uh, um, uh, weather or light conditions. So um, we have done some study and it, it's positive. Uh, we have a correlation uh, and uh, uh, um, uh, probability of uh, detection bigger than 95% and this is a, um, uh, a number that is uh, um, a result of uh, uh, a validation study. So 95% of reliability for uh, object detection independently from uh, light condition or weather condition. Of course, as Chris was mentioning, if there's water filling up uh, potholes or cracks, so this can be um, a factor outside uh, the, the statistic, but uh, we recommend to execute uh, um, the data collection uh, with uh, w without presence of water on the ground. That's the limit. And due to the limits of the traditional uh, measurement devices in many countries and states, they have uh, regulations on when you have to do the measurements. So even if the system allows to, you have to watch out that the road authority allows to measure in other weather conditions. If there's a lot of fog and very heavy rain, I don't advise to uh, detect automatically those distresses. Huh? We, ca we cannot train the neural network in any condition, but the standard conditions in which you can do survey or train. The the case mentioned, like uh, presence of tree or um, yeah. like um, that's standard. Uh, yeah. yeah, early day or or later uh, during sunset. That that's, that's the main problem. Yeah. Oh. It's a different kind of, of uh, camera that is combined with the uh, six with the the, the the lidar. So it's not a camera like uh, even with the latest iPhones. Right? It's it's really a special camera that is used to collect the data uh, accurate to deliver to the neural network. Okay. Thank you. Thank you both again. So we have another question here, and I'm not sure exactly what they mean, but it says, can you share some system deliverables with us? Yeah. Um, I think uh, they, uh, the question refers uh, to the type of output. Uh, and in this case, the type of output goes from a traditional LAS file, which uh, uh, basically, um, uh, contain information of the point cloud, every point, uh, as uh, is georeferenced with latitude, longitude, and elevation. 
and uh, uh, reflectivity information plus uh, also the position of, uh, of the image. Um, of course, every image captured by the, uh, the camera is also part of the output and each image is georeferenced. In addition to this, uh, uh, we automatically report uh, um, in a CSV or Excel compatible uh, um, uh, file, uh, the IRI value, georeference, the routing value, georeference, um, the road quality index, uh, let's say similar to the PCI with the, the georeference of this information. We output PGM file for the um, uh, lane marking, so for the reflectivity. It is also present in the LAS and also a point cloud in CSV that can be imported in any point cloud viewer, such as Cloud Compare. Uh, and this tool can be used to, uh, to, to take also geometrical measurements of the point cloud. So these are the main. Maybe I forgot something, Chris. The extra distresses, uh, the 14 distresses, they come also in an accessible uh, file format like CSV where you have categorized the type of distress, so the different kind of cracks and potholes and so on, the location exactly, and then there's a calculation of the surface uh, that they that they affect. And with that list, you can then filter for, for instance, only the cracks and give that list to your team that have to fill up the cracks with some, with some liquid asphalt. But of course, not the crocodile cracks. Those you cannot fill up just with uh, liquid asphalt. Eh? You need another measure. You need to identify based on the geometry what is the cause of the ge of the crocodile cracks. So you really split them up in different types of distresses that need different kind of analysis and different repair methods. But that is the list you get, so you can do that. Okay, thank you, Chris and Jacopo. Uh, another question here. And it's asked, how many gigabytes per kilometer? Yeah, we can share actually um, uh, data sheet. Uh, so you, you can contact us. We will share a data sheet that contains all this information. But uh, in general, uh, we talk about, uh, um, uh, give me a second. OK. So. Um, it's about uh, uh, 640 megabytes per kilometer in the CSV. The LAS is about 1.5 gigabytes per kilometer. Um, and the LAZ, that is a compressed version, is 96 megabytes per kilometer. So the system comes with a hard drive uh, um, up to, uh, I think, 4 terabytes, and that's more than enough for normally a multi-day survey and, and the pictures are downsized keeping the quality to jpeg formats and what's the size per picture we, we normally take a picture every five meters so to reduce the data and not to have too much overlap and and each picture in, in jpeg is is what Jacopo, you know 12 megabytes is about uh about 500 megabytes per kilometer each, each okay. single picture is 2.5 megabytes so depending okay. on how no. yeah as you mentioned the frequency okay thank thank you very much both i just have a few more questions here so and one is <laughs> how often do you need to survey the pavement uh to save budget yeah so um, there are different uh, different uh, uh, payment uh, degradation model uh, available. Um, uh, there are more accurate, less accurate. Uh, there are so uh, the minimum uh, traditionally used is uh, a two years, two years time for a survey. But of course, uh, um, with two years you can miss uh, uh, some behavior that are uh, outside the, the, the standard model. So uh, now the tendency is going is moving toward one, year, one time per year. And we have some customer, as mentioned by Chris, in Japan that are um, 
uh, running the surveys uh, two times uh, per year. Uh, it so it depends a little the... bit also. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, it depends a little bit also what are the contractual requirements, like in this case for the Japanese customer. Um, it's a highway, so uh, the flatness and the maintenance has a high impact on the safety of the road. And I also need to fulfill uh, government contracts that require this uh, standard. But also now we are seeing uh, municipalities that are not uh, uh, constrained to strict uh, government uh, requirements that are moving toward uh, um, yearly, uh, a yearly survey. And this is because they are seeing that uh, they can actually uh, optimize the use of budget better than what they spend with the survey with uh, such a fra frequency. And the now, Chris, you wanted to add something? Yeah, it, it also depends on the, on the weather conditions. Eh? If you have hot summer and very cold winter, then your pavement suffers a lot more. Uh, I think you can see that also in, in Detroit and all the funds they have to invest now to repair those massive uh, potholes. That's very costly. If they would have repaired it over time more frequently, they would not have that cost. And the optimum actually is if you have those uh, heavy uh, weather conditions, then the optimum is, is indeed at least once a year. Uh, just after winter is the best. Detect where you need to, for safety reasons and comfort reasons, where you do the, do the, need to do the repair and do them immediately over time before the next winter happens. And there is scientific study, eh? and, and, and probably depending on different states, you might have a um, slightly different outcome of those scientific studies. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jacopo. I have another question here, and it says, how long does the processing take after collecting data from the field? The processing takes uh, today takes twice the time of the data capturing. And we are working on a next version to have it uh, as this, at the same speed of the data collection. That is the goal for uh, very soon. We do start the processing on board, as Jacopo mentioned, uh, meaning that if you have done your data collection, you drive home and you let run uh, the computer uh, a couple more hours, your analysis is done. We would, we would like to have you done everything done when you arrive home. Okay, excellent. There's another question here, and it asks, so what are the requirements of the G of the GIS platform to upload such a 6D digital twin? No requirements. Yeah. Any, any GIS can do the job. We 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 are. Uh, aligned with the format requires for a GS. GS have standard formats, whether it's ArcGIS or QGIS or another GS uh, platform. We, we foresee as output the standard art formats you need to upload. Yeah, your, uh, um, your GIS um, must be compatible with LAS. Um, we, we like to work with the QGIS, uh, QGIS because it's uh, freeware, uh, but actually uh, we are also partner with uh, ESRI, where we are a, uh, we are a ESRI partner, and uh, um, uh, using ArcGIS uh, you can get the most out uh, of our data, but also other, other GIS are compatible. Okay, thank you, that clearly answers the question. Another question here says, if you're using the dual lane system, does the traffic on the other lane interfere with the measurement? It does, yeah. So um, what the Japanese do, they measure uh, at night and there's almost no traffic on the neighboring lane. Uh, otherwise, you have to visualize to keep the upcoming traffic away. The, the system is designed that the surface where the measurements are done are close by the measuring vehicle and also on the neighboring lane. So this reduces the risk if you have a good indication that uh, upcoming traffic should uh, keep distance or stay away. 
And if the other traffic is passing by quickly, then it's filtered out. Uh, the, the result uh, in case of, of a vehicle, especially for stationary vehicle, will be a small area where the data are missing, but the, the output will still be generated and you will have simply a, um, a dual lane road with some spots with missing data. Also, if the vehicle is driving faster than uh, the survey vehicle, uh, there is a high chance that uh, um, the survey vehicle will still capture data uh, before and after the passage, filling the gap. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. And I have, I think I have one more question here, and it asks, how do you group the pavement distresses for efficient repairs? So you, you start actually on which kind of distress requires the same kind of repair. So as I uh, said before, uh, different cracks or joints that are missing, missing, they ask a very simple repair with filling it up with one team with, by, with liquid uh, asphalt. And that's an easy. So you should group all those distresses that have the same quick repair and locate them and give your team uh, the, the geolocations where they have to do the job. Uh, crack, uh, uh, alligator cracks, as mentioned, there you have to study first what is the reason of the of the alligator cracks. Is it because of moisture coming up or is it uh, really the, the lifetime of the, of the pavement before you take action? So it is grouping per repair that we normally do. Uh, potholes can also be with uh, liquid asphalt, but only the potholes are not too big. So if the damage is too big, then you need to go for a new layer. If the, if the, if the, if the, if the damage is not too big, you can go with a slam layer. So it's really grouping on by the way of, you know, that you want to repair and that you can do yourself or as your contactor or written advice. And, and that is the, the strength of it. Huh? Okay, thank you. And I think I have a few more, a couple more questions here. So there's one here, and it's related to speed again. It says if data is collected at 150 kilometers an hour, are the results the same if the data is collected at 40 kilometers per hour? Does the speed affect the result? I know you've kind of addressed that question before. The, the speed we advise is 90 kilometers per hour, which is what, uh, 60, 60 miles uh, per 60 hour? 60 miles, yeah. And, and, and the reason for that is also the camera image start blurring if you have at higher speed. So 150 kilometers an hour, the, the, the lighter could do the job at 120 kilometers an hour and still have a four meter or seven and a half meet, meter wide uh, lane uh, digitization. But the camera will get blurring. So we advise not to go above 90 kilometers per hour. Yeah. Which is yeah, the allowable IRI, on every the lane IRI. on the highway. Yeah. With uh, with high speed uh, bigger uh, higher than uh, 60 miles per hour, um, the IRI is still uh, uh, compatible with uh, uh, ASCM uh, requirements and national requirements up to 120 kilometers per hour that equal about. Uh, like 70, 75 miles per hour. Um, so for highway situation, the IRI can still be a valid output. Okay, thank you both. And I have one final question here before we conclude. And that question is, is this approach compatible with the DOT's requirements and standards? Yes, actually, um, any DOTs, um, at least in the United States, there is a, a ASTM standard and the ASHTO standard that are um, uh, universally recognized. And uh, yet, the, the the 60 has been designed to be compatible to exactly those uh, um, uh, those requirements. Uh, we also uh, in Belgium create, as you know better, we are compliant with the Belgian DOT. Um, uh, requirements um, and uh, similar to other states uh, like in Japan probably because uh, 
we have a customer that are working on highway, so subject. We are compatible to, uh, there as job. well. Yeah. Yeah. And and actually, NCAT, so, which we mentioned, and uh, which your team did, Jacopo, uh, is is known worldwide. Uh, and the NCAT yeah. is the STM and the ASCO check. That is what they do. And um, we both provide systems and we do some measurements. But our focus is also to help customers to get their NCAT certification using our equipment. So we have engineering service, we have support uh, to make it happen. We know uh, they can do it and we support that. And that's also for other, I, I think most worldwide that experience, I, I don't know exactly about Japan, but they passed because it's the government agency themselves. But uh, worldwide, they, they really uh, um, apply the NCAT uh, requirements. Well, thank you, uh, Jacopo and Chris. Uh, thank you for your valuable uh, time today and, and taking all this extra time to answer all these questions. Uh, we truly value it. Uh, to each and every participant, uh, we extend our sincerest gratitude for your presence at today's webinar. As a reminder, you'll soon receive an email containing both a PDF copy and a video recording of today's uh, illuminating discourse, typically within the next 24 hours. Uh, within the same email, you'll find the survey. Your feedback is invaluable to our continuous quest to tailor our webinars to your exact needs. For now, we express our deepest thanks for your participation, and we're eagerly anticipating the pleasure of your company at our forthcoming events. Uh, thank you again, everyone. That was a fantastic webinar. We look forward to, again to seeing you at the next event. Have a good day, everyone. Thank, thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you, Majid. Take thank care. you to everyone.